Um, we have uh, Graham Lord from Fairport Yacht Support. Make sure you ask Graham about his tarantula experience. Uh, he's a CEO, opened his door to Fairport Yacht Support in October 2011, recognizing the industry's need for an independent yacht management group. Uh, he, you know, he, great resume here, been around a long time, done great service for the industry, Super Yacht Association membership, and uh, recently acquired by IGY, recently acquired by Marine Max. And who got, anybody by Marine Max yet that you're aware of? No? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I'll leave it to Graham and take it from there, Graham. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I think uh, everyone in this room has the same end goal, and that's to get us to the closing table. So uh, you're going to hear a whole bunch of acronyms now. We're going to acronym soup. Um, by the way, why does abbreviation have so many letters in it? Um, so in the, in the panel we have here, Laura Noll, who's with Ali, Ali Mass, Rogers and Lindsay, an attorney there. Uh, from the Coast Guard, we have Victoria Schroeder and Fernando Cruz. And from Cayman Island Shipping Registry, we have uh, Sagal uh, Kailada, Kadilada, it's a tough one. Kadiala, it's a tough one. Uh, the subject today is uh, tier two, tier three engines. Seems to be one of the hot buttons that we have. It, uh, it rolls into the uh, EPA reg regulations and the IMO regulations. So I'm going to hand over to Lara to, to start the process of trying to delineate the difference between what the EPA wants, what the IMO wants, and how that folds into tier two and tier three engines, which is for the benefit of the room, the emissions standards that are required, and how it differs from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. I have a PowerPoint for this. <laughs> okay. So just to be clear, anytime we're talking about a tier, it can be very confusing because there are two separate regulations and they both use the label tier to delineate the standard required under those regulations. They also use a numbering system <laughs> which sounds similar when you're talking in numerals and numbers. So anytime we're talking about what tier applies, we should delineate whether it's EPA tier or IMO tier. The EPA and the IMO are different regulations. They are different people. They walk into different buildings. These are their headquarters. Um, the regulations are not apples to oranges. The EPA regulations test for more pollutants than just NOx. They also test for hydrocarbons and they require that the standards be maintained either for a 10-year period or the life of the engine. So IMO regulations and IMO compliance are not a substitute for EPA compliance. So that's a big difference you need to know. The EPA applies to domestic vessels and domestic waters under the Clean Air Act, that's 40 CFR. Compliance is evidenced by an emissions label and certificate of conformity. If there is no emissions label, then it is not certified. No label, no certification. In some cases, in later model years, there will specifically be a label on the engine that says this engine is not compliant to EPA regulations. So you may find the answer sooner rather than later, though it's probably not the answer you're hoping for if you're looking for an EPA label. IMO are the international regulations. Those are delineated under Marple Annex 6. Those are also evidenced by an emissions label um, with an EIAPP certificate. The EI, EIAPP certificate is the Engine International Air Pollution Prevention Certificate. And it generally is serial number specific to the particular engine and issued by class like DNV, GL, or um, in some cases on a family basis by the EPA. This is what's so confusing. <laughs> EPA Tier 1 <laughs> is not the same as IMO Tier 1. And when you're speaking, uh, it, it's just misleading because are you talking about the numeral one or, or, or the number one? Um, the EPA regulations go all the way to Tier 4. That's generally for commercial engines only. So we usually don't see that. Um, we see only EPA Tier 3 for recreational engines. Um, and for IMO, it goes up to tier three, but I think, Graham, I'll leave that for you for later. I know you have some questions on that. They apply the EPA tier three to specific areas. This map isn't showing very well, but you basically see the whole of North America and a lot of the EU. 
The EPA applies to all U.S. documented vessels and vessels imported into the stream of commerce in the U.S. Um, the EPA regulations have been in place a lot longer than the IMO ones. Just to give you an example, the EPA has regulated outboard engines since 1999. If it's an engine on a U.S. vessel, it is regulated. If it emits exhaust, whether it's a generator engine or a main engine, if it emits exhaust, it is regulated. The IMO applies only to engines that are at least 130 kilowatts, vessels built after the year 2000, um, and only for those vessels that are in actual international commerce, or international voyages, I should say. EPA labels. Um, sometimes you can order a replacement label. This is actually very tricky. Uh, you have to order it from the manufacturer and only specified technicians can apply new labels to engines, so it's not like you can mail order EPA labels and have them FedEx to you. Um, you have to make an appointment. The label has to be produced at a factory. It has to be shipped to a particular dealer and then installed on the vessel. So Graham and I were talking about um, preparation for your closing. And if this is something that you find out, you know, two days before closing that, you know, the engine is compliant but you need a label, it's not going to be resolved in time for closing. So you'll need a mechanism to handle that. Um, the IMO is obviously probably what most people are familiar with is the EIAPP certificates and the technical files. The technical files are required to be maintained on board the vessel. Um, and this is just a matter of money. I mean, unfortunately, manufacturers are passing the cost of compliance through to the owners. Um, so if you order an engine, you have to make sure that you're checking the box for both EPA and IMO emissions because it costs money to submit this information to EPA and to get it approved and to have the testing procedures done. This is what an EPA label looks like. Um, it says 40 CFR on it. There's an engine family number. Um, these are regulated in the different tiers by liter per cylinder displacement, which is the number in the top middle. Uh, but this is what we're looking for when we're looking for an EPA label. If I ask for an EPA label, don't send this. This is an IMO label. It says it complies with MARPOL. So you can have an engine that has neither one or both of these, right? But this is the main one that we're looking for if your client wants to charter in U.S. waters, wants to bonus depreciate either a U.S. vessel or a foreign, as a U.S. or foreign flag vessel, uh, this is what we need to find. If you're having trouble finding it, there's apps now. <laughs> How cool. Um, Caterpillar has an emissions app, so does John Deere. So if at least you know the serial number of the engine, you may be able to look it up. Unfortunately, MTU does not have an app. They do have a regulatory at Rolls-Royce email address, but responses can take a while. So again, um, preparation is really key. Here's just an example. I used the label before. I plugged it into the Caterpillar app, and it sent me a link right to the EPA Certificate of Conformity. You have other tools. You can also Google um, the specifications for that particular engine. I used a generator engine example here. Um, and in particular, it says that this engine, under the generator features, I've highlighted it, this engine is EPA compliant 60 hertz model only. So you know if you couldn't find an EPA label and you check the specifications and yours is the 50 hertz model, it's probably not an EPA certified engine. Um, when is compliance checked? Um, for EPA, it's at the time of importation. This is the customs importation form. Generally, dealers and manufacturers are filling this out for the new vessels that they're putting into commerce. Um, and on the IMO side, it's generally uh, port state control inspections or flag state inspections. And those um, offices have guidance that they'll talk about separately. Penalties uh, for improper importation of engines. This means you're fudging the label first. That's kind of hard to do because although it's small on the form, uh, you have to input the actual serial numbers of the engines. So you really shouldn't be doing, doing that unless you're really confused. Um, but the, <laughs> but the, the, uh, the, the worst case scenario is seizure of the engine by CBP because the engines can't be seized separately from the vessel. So if you have a vessel seized over EPA issues, you're having a really bad day. Uh, best practices is when you get the listing. Just get a photo of the HIN. Get a photo of the, EP, of the serial numbers of each engine. Serial numbers are different than um, emissions labels. 
get the photo of the EPA emissions labels and the IMO emissions labels, double check those emissions labels with the certificates of conformity for EPA and the EIAPP certificates for the IMO rules. Um, and if you don't have EIAPP certificates, and it happens very often that the owner will say, well, the seller will say, I've never had them and it's not been a problem. Well, that's true. Um, if you're only operating the vessel in, in New York state waters, you probably don't care to have an EIAPP certificates, but sophisticated buyers are looking for these nonetheless. When you get a listing, is the time to double check it? That's it. For intro to EPA versus IMO regulations. Thank you, Laura. So to add the next layer, ju different jurisdictions have different requirements. So uh, with the US Coast Guard, what are the current requirements or what direction can you give the audience to be on the lookout for from a um, compliance and prevention side in US waters? So um, there's a couple of things that are in here that is not mentioned, but the EPA indeed has an IMO, um, kind of like a backside to the story where the Coast Guard has an MOU with the EPA to continue enforcing their regulations in the US waters. Now, our primary job is IMO. Um, the, the, the tricky part is gonna be when it comes to a old engine and a new engine, right? So, if you read the policy letter, and we went through this a million times last night trying to figure out why there's a big miscommunication between the EPA and the IMO, uh, but everything we found so far, it kept still sending us from the EPA webpage to the IMO regulation. Now, if you read the tiers, they are confusing, extremely confusing, but at the end of the day, they end up being almost the same. So when it comes to meet the requirement, if you're meeting the IMO requirement, unless you're a tier four, you're extremely close to meet the requirement of tier ones, two, and three. Um, for engines, let's say for an example, you have a, a old boat that is before 2021. Um, even in our policy letter, and I give you the number because this is available in the webpage and everybody, everybody can see it. But if you go to policy letter 2101, it's gonna explain everything we're gonna be doing with this. Okay, so it gave us the authority and how we're gonna enforce it. Now, can we enforce everything? Yes, IMO and EPA. Now, if CVP, with the CVP form that is extremely confusing, um, if CVP has that number, they're gonna call, call the EPA. And the EPA is gonna call the Coast Guard because they're gonna use us as a enforcement authority. We're gonna go on board the port state control exam. We're gonna match all the numbers. If indeed we, as the marine inspector or surveyor, whoever is on board, look at the numbers and they do meet the requirements, that in there should not be an issue for anyone. Now, the rule is gonna be 2023 and then 20 to 20, 2021 to 2023. Any vessel that has started construction in 2021, you are in a waiver period for all engines. That doesn't mean you're gonna be able to be exempt in the long run. It says that if the engine is not available, when you build the vessel, you will be allowed to operate with the, within those two years. After 2023, we'll wait for the guidance. Um, but it's, we'll, it's a lot of learning. Marple Air is changing everything and we all in the shop are learning as much as you guys are confused, so trust me. So for the benefit of the group, I'll try to simplify this. It doesn't fall under one, uh, there's, not, there's no one size fits all in this. So for example, in order to uh, satisfy the Coast Guard, you have to import the engine. To import the engine, you have to use Customs and Border Patrol, who then reports to the EPA, who then report to the Coast Guard, and none of those departments talk to each other. So it gets a little bit difficult. Uh, so I go from a Cayman Island, and we're gonna use Cayman Island as a basis for all the other flag states, because I think we all know in this room that they pretty much follow each other in, in that arena other than the US flag, because it's fairly new to us in the over 300 ton arena, so. Sure, thanks Graham, thanks everyone else. Um, 
From our perspective, we are concerned with flags that with yachts that are registered with us, with the Cayman Island Shipping Registry, wherever they are in the world. Uh, the topic of discussion today is yachts operating in U.S. waters. In 2021, the requirement to have um, engines fitted came into force. So that means if a yacht was being built any time after January 1st, 2021, they ought to have had IMO Tier 3 engines installed at build. And what happened there at build would determine the legality of that yacht for the rest of its life. Also coming into force was an ECA that you heard Laura mention, an environmental control area that has more stringent environmental standards applied to it. The North American ECA encompasses the United States and extends into Canada as well. So for a yacht that was built since January 1st, 2021, it ought to have had IMO tier three engines if it intended to operate in US waters because of the ECA. It wouldn't have been illegal to install older engines, but that may have had the effect of limiting where it could operate in the future. And that's the really big issue, I think, for the people in this room. The decisions that were made at build will affect the yacht and its ability to cruise and operate into the future. The enforcement of the North American ECA, I think, should have started at the beginning of next year, but, or at the end of this year, but instead is being deferred Enforcement of it in the US is being deferred until the end of 2023. Uh, as my colleague here in the US Coast Guard mentioned, that means that projects, the keels of which were laid up until 2023, the end of 2023, will be okay in North American waters. The complicating factor is that the North American ECA extends into Canada, and I don't have any information on whether Canadian authorities are going to defer enforcement in the same way that the US Coast Guard has. So you may already be facing some limitations in cruising as early as next year. Also, as the US Coast Guard said, it remains to be seen what, if any, further deferral may take place at the end of 2023. But as of right now, if a yacht, if a yacht was after 2023, if a keel is laid and older tier, IMO Tier 2 engines are installed, the owner at that time, or any future owner, may face restrictions on trying to enter US waters, which is a huge, huge stumbling block. I don't know of any mechanism to, to alleviate that after 2023 on those keels which have been laid. I'm not aware of any policy workaround to get around that. So that should be a question you'd be asking, certainly at the new build phase, but just over the next year or so, keep in mind that as you get closer and closer to the end of 2023, what documentation the yacht has been supplied with at build will get more and more important to you and any future owners. We, as the Cayman Island Shipping Registry, strictly speaking, operating a non-compliant engine in an ECA, regardless of what the local port state says about enforcement, is technically a violation of our merchant shipping law it's unlikely that we would take any enforcement action if the coastal state opts not to and defers enforcement action. We would likely follow the same approach. But that doesn't help at all in Canadian waters, which are subject to the ECA, because as I said, I don't believe they've deferred enforcement. Um, I think that's the long and short of it. Um, we are encouraging uh, so, as you can imagine, whenever these keel laying date enforcement uh, requirements come into place, there's a flurry of activity at the shipyards to get keels laid down, get things going, get them documented, so then they're locked in with those previous requirements. Uh, we've even had shipyards try to start keels, make them dormant, resurrect them, and try to get around it in those sorts of ways. We've essentially closed the book on that. The problem is that, as I said earlier, it's still not illegal, even if you lay a keel right now, to install IMO Tier 2 engines, but it will have future implications. These rules are changing all the time. Each local coastal state changes their enforcement actions all the time. And so it's important for you to understand what any future owner may be, be held to. Um, it's always going to be whoever's holding the boat right now. Whoever owns a boat right now is going to be the party that has to comply with the regulations. I, I hope that was at least a little bit clear. Yeah, so you touched on something there, especially with new construction. It's quite common with uh, yacht builders to buy a 
a bunch of engines at one time to get a discount. And this is what we're seeing is engines that are technically new insofar as they have no hours on them, but do not comply with current or were built before current regulations were, uh, were implemented. Another thing that we see a lot in the field is um, engines should be nice and pretty and white. So you peel off all those labels and all that nonsense and paint it, well, then the, la the label doesn't exist uh, anymore. And as, as you heard from Laura, that you can't just go and print that label up on your handy dandy printer and, and put it on yourself. Um, so Laura, you were gonna? One thing I just wanna add to uh, what Cigar and, and Jose and Victoria are talking about with the IMO regulations is that it applies to a narrow class of vessels to start with. That class of vessels happens to be the majority of vessels in South Florida, as Graham has mentioned before. Um, so this regulation, the IMO regulations are enforced for all vessels after a certain build date, regardless of length, regardless of tonnage. There's a specific carve out, and that's this deferral of enforcement with the US Coast Guard policy letter, and that applies only to vessels that are over 24 meters and less than 500 gross tons. And the reason is a practical one because the space of the engine area available doesn't allow for either urea holding tanks or the extra exhaust scrubbers that they need to get the emissions levels down to the IMO tier three level. So that's why we have this special rule in place. It's not for the really big boys. The big, the big boats that are over 500 gross tons should have absolutely no problem getting IMO tier three engines. The other thing that you mentioned, Graham, which is um, when manufacturers order engines in bulk and then try to put them into later keel dates, the regulations, uh, especially the EPA regulations, assume that, that, the, that the keel laid date and the model year of the engine match perfectly. But it's often that the keel was laid in 2004 and then maybe the engine was manufactured in 2006. The EPA will tell you that just because the engine was manufactured in a later year, it doesn't mean that it, need, it can be compliant to a lesser standard. So you have to look at both the keel laid date for the vessel and the engine manufacture date for the engine. Uh, so for the regulators, is there any difference between a private yacht or a commercial yacht? No, not from our perspective. Uh, Marpol and marine pollution prevention conventions do not make any distinction between mode of operation, between pleasure and commercial. And I think that's really important to emphasize because there is often uh, the argument in the yachting industry that this is a private yacht so the regulations don't apl apply. Anything to do with pollution, garbage, etc., applies to absolutely everybody across the board. Um, so I'd like to get into prevention because it rolls in quite well with what the previous panel was talking about in, uh, in the insurance side is getting on top of it early. Um, I'll go through the group. In your, in your ideal scenario, when is the right time to, to check the status and understand the, yacht, the vessel you're listing or the vessel you're representing the buyer? When, when is the best time to understand what its compliance status is? At, at the listing agreement. And look, these regulations, this EPA form that I put up there, that form was created in 2016. Um, the enforcement on it actually hasn't been regularly enforced by CBP until maybe 2021. So even in the practice of running our deals, our firm wasn't always in the practice of collecting EPA emissions label. It's a relatively new thing. So even deals that I closed in 2020 or in 2021, I may not have obtained the generator engine emissions labels. So if I see that that owner has now signed a listing agreement, I'm going back to that client and back to that captain and saying, go get me the generator engine emissions label before we were only thinking of the main engines. And then I go back and I update their closing binder and I say, okay, now we're ready for sale. And from the US Coast Guard perspective, I think one of the most common things that I hear is, well, they never asked for it before, why does it matter? Uh, what should we anticipate from an enforcement, just from a practical aspect from an enforcement uh, as we move forward? Enforcement wise, I'll tell you right now, I will not have the answer. Um, I will definitely get back with the, some of our office deals more with enforcement. Um, as a marine inspector, we will be the ones checking everything. For an example, we go on board and we 
take a picture of your EI PP and we take it to the engine room and match all the numbers. If something is weird with that, then we'll re we enforce it. We send everything for enforcement. So it's a different, completely office now. And we and we have to go back a little bit because I know we continue talking about EPA and Coast Guard, but IMO regulations. The EPA is sending everybody to the IMO regulation. Even in their web page, they're sending everybody to the IMO regulation. So we did a lot of reading in the last two days, and I think that for enforcement, we'll have to wait until the EPA does an MOU with the Coast Guard, and that MOU can be enforced by us. In the meantime, I think the EPA will be the only one enforcing it, at least in my opinion. Um, I, will get, I will need to get more information on that, but without the MOU saying, hey, you will enforce this, we cannot do it because right now we're enforcing IMO regulations. And I think as an industry, we've been quite fortunate in South Florida between Miami, uh, Fort Lauderdale, and Palm Beach. These are very busy ports. So uh, enforcement and Coast Guard have a heavy workload as it is. So I don't think it's a question of it hasn't been in place. It just has, it's, it's in force, but has not been enforced just yet. Um, from a Cayman Island Shipping Registry perspective, what's yeah, implementation we, enforcement? Yeah, if enforcement would take two forms. Uh, the first is less of interest, I think, to the people in this room. It's when somebody like me goes on board to do an annual survey. I'd be looking for certificates, documentation, functional tests of the yacht, and we may turn up that we don't have the appropriate IAPPs or engine IAPPs that Laura mentioned, and then we would have a deficiency. We may ask the ship not to sail, or usually, so long as we see some kind of proactive measures being taken, we'll allow the ship to sail, but we need to see it closed down within a reasonable time frame. I think more relevant to you would be on closings and reflaggings. So if it's a, uh, for example, a Marshall Islands yacht that's now changing ownership and then reflagging with the Cayman Islands, before we can accept it onto the flag, we need to make sure that all the documents and certificates are in place. You're probably used to, on the buyer side, um, I suppose you're probably used to having class on board as soon as a yacht changes hands. Changes flags, class goes on board, changes all the name on the certificates, changes the flag. What's also part of that and happening in the background before it even gets to that is that the ship certificates will go across somebody like my desk uh, for vetting and technical approval. And if the required certificates aren't there, we'll just say stop and one of our registrars will go back to you and, and say that we need more information. So that will delay you, that will hold up deals and that will cause a lot of problems if it's not, if it's not provided to us in time. I'll just take the opportunity to deviate a little bit from the tier three discussion to also say that uh, in 2015, the Coast Guard uh, enforced a policy which required a basic safety certificate on all foreign flag yachts over 300 gross tons, even if they're purely private. As a response, we of course need to comply with that and make sure that our yachts comply with that. So we started an inspection regime on yachts over 300 gross tons when they're in US waters. Since 2015, we've achieved a high level of compliance, but that seems to have fallen off a little bit, so I think it's worth reiterating. If you have a yacht that's changing flag to the Cayman Islands, it's over 300 gross tons, we need to get on board as soon as possible after the change uh, of flag or on the change of flag uh, in order to carry out a basic safety inspection. That will keep the yacht um, safe from any, well, I shouldn't say that, but it will help to uh, make sure that you're complying with US Coast Guard requirements. Uh, as soon as you're in US, in US waters, you're subject to port state control by our friends here, and making sure that your clients have our surveys scheduled on time will help to ensure that the closing goes smoothly and then operations go smoothly immediately after. So if you have a deal going through, if you're not sure of what level of compliance your clients need, please reach out to us as early as possible in the process. It may be something that we can even do while the buyer still has it. We might even be able to get on board and do the survey under those circumstances so that the closing is just that much easier. We would welcome that conversation at any time in the process. So I think one of the things to emphasize also here is, is buyer beware, because you might be able to successfully close a vessel under, uh, or a vessel you may have closed three or four years ago. When you get a phone call two years from now saying, you sold me this vessel, but it can't do X, Y, Z, and you did not, you've 
represent me correctly or falsely rec uh, represented me, be armed with this knowledge because quite likely that scenario is, could come up as this continues to evolve. And this is a problem, well, it's a regulation that's not going away. Um, we've only got about 10 more minutes, so I wanted to make uh, uh, some question and answer time. If anybody has any questions, fabulous. I think we have a couple. I will get to you in just a second there, I promise. Hey, thank, thank you for this uh, conversation. The question basically under 24 meters on the smaller boats, with hmm. the emission certificate on the engines and the EIAPP certificate, do they go together? Is the EIAPP certificate necessary to be on board along with the emission stickers on the engines. Did you say under 24 meters, yes. sorry? Yes. Um. For EPA regulations, no label is no certification. There is no piece of paper that is a substitute for the label on the engine, and I believe that it's the same under the IMO. What you have in the certificates is just additional proof that yes, this is an engine that belongs to a regulated family that submitted the proper data that was approved by the EPA or the IMO. So you're looking for those labels, the pictures that I showed you on the engines. You need to find those labels. And if you have those labels there, then you should be able to get the paper. You can get the paper either by contacting the manufacturer, MTU or Rolls-Royce, um, or using the app or asking the EPA. Actually, there's an imports at epa.gov website that they are email address that's manned by somebody, a contractor for the EPA. If you send him a picture of an EPA emissions label, that one, He'll, he'll spit you back the um, certificate of conformity. They can't do that for the EIAPP certificates. Manufacturers are holding them close to chest because they charge you for them. Hang on, part two. So in, in converse of that, is the EIAPP certificate necessary to be on board? Yes, it should be. Okay, because those are expensive and they are hard to get a hold of. If the vessel is engaging in international voyages, the answer is yes. If the, en if the vessel is not engaging in international voyages, if you've got a vessel purely up in the Northeast, then it wouldn't really matter. But for vessels that are between here and the Bahamas, um, those are considered international voyages, and yes, you should have them. Okay, thank you. And, and just a follow-up comment on that prevention. You will, none of these, deficiencies can be fixed quickly. This is not a matter of uh, make a phone call and we'll get it on board in an hour. These are all weeks, months, possibly even years to fix. Uh, well, again, what we see in the field internationally is a misunderstanding of these regulations. So a port state inspector incorrectly requests something. It doesn't really matter. They're the ones with the gun. And uh, you know, better to have them on board. Um, I just wanted to bring a comment to the Coast Guard um, discussion because there was a, a comment about how everything is kind of deferred to the IMO and, you're, and, and sending to the IMO website and so forth. And I think um, maybe it would be helpful for the room to know that the reason why, maybe, um, why you're saying that is because, of course, foreign flag vessels don't have to comply with the um, US EPA requirements. So I think you were discussing foreign flag stuff so they basically say unless you're importing or flagging here you wouldn't have to comply with the US EPA requirements you only have to comply with that in the context of the new tier 3 IMO requirement so if you don't meet the IMO tier 3 you'd have to meet the EPA tier 3 requirement to be able to um, allow the foreign flag vessel to come in after the January 1st 2021 deadline to, to use the U.S. waters. So I just wanted to make that comment because, um, and also one of the other factors for deciding whether or not the boat could come here is, is um, with an engine that's a tier, IMO tier two, is the, um, whether or not the Coast Guard has, uh, you, you've convinced the Coast Guard that there's no um, alternative engine that's available, that, that there's no tier three engine that you could install. So that is one of the factors. And if you don't have that piece of paper, what I've been told by the uh, EPA is that you'll, you'll be in violation because that is a factor 
Paul, if I could just say that, Erin, uh, you're exactly right. The bizarre thing about these regulations, especially the EPA ones, is they don't apply to foreign flag vessels that are here on a cruising license and on a purely recreational basis and are not imported into the U.S. So if you're walking down the dock and you don't know the importation status of each vessel, it could have vastly different engines. And why does one have to apply, um, comply with the EPA regulations versus the other? It comes down to whether or not the vessel's been imported on the foreign flag side. But the IMO regulations are always there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't think you've gotten around it. Yeah. Uh, was there another question there, Paul? No. Nope. Or somebody at the back could raise their, their hand. Uh, I, I can always depend upon Kevin Ralph. <laughs> I guess it was just a, uh, a summation and qualification. So over 24 meters, sub 500 GT, uh, from January 1st, 2021 to the end, whatever the end of 23 is, assuming December 31st, there is a waiver period. Is that for importation? Um, no. no Th those regulations so. are applying um, if the engine is over 130 kilowatts, full stop. And what Aaron was just mentioning is that it's only until 2023 or a suitable engine becomes available. And how you prove a negative is very difficult, right? So Erin uh, is suggesting that maybe you can have a letter from the manufacturer saying that you know, an engine's not available for this power category that you need. Um, the Coast Guard, in their guidance letter, there's no submit your queries. He, I mean, you can ask them questions, there's, but there's not, there's not like a pre-approval. You can't say, here's my vessel and here's my engines. Can you please bless them? There's nobody really doing that. So you're just kind of operating on um, you know, kind of an honor system in, until then. Yeah, but with so supply chain issues as they are now, um, I think it would be pretty easy to prove that if it, whether or not the engine is physically available, they may be hard to procure. But then what happens when you sell the boat or resell the boat in January of 25, and tier three was meant to have come in in 21, after the fact, after the waiver is over? So well, it, if your vessel was built in that period, yeah. I would just send them this guidance letter. I think the guidance letter in it states that yachts, the keels uh, laid during that period will be considered acceptable. I, I want to say indefinitely is my yeah. understanding of the letter. Yeah, great. Thank you. And again, for the benefit, good luck going to an engine manufacturer and getting that letter written. Uh, they have no appetite for this. They have no interest in, in addressing this issue. So that's, that's what the, the subject is. Before we shut down, is there any Graham, reference? Of Graham, it's, it's not the manufacturer, it's the Coast Guard. There is, I know, Laura, like, like if you, there are people that actually do make that analysis that, to give you the letter mm -hmm. to, to say, okay, we agree, there's no suitable engine. It's not the, it's not the manufacturer okay. that does that. Uh, is there any uh, reference material, websites, anywhere that uh, we should point out to the audience for more guidance or direction? Coming into the Miami area, you have the um, home port. We try to put everything in there for you guys. And lately, we've been trying to, you know, our job is prevention, right? Prevent everything. And one of the things that we're trying to do is even prevent issues with the industry, like even as simple as NOA requirements. So what we've been trying to do lately is we're writing more MSIBs for the industry to see. So you guys know that we are there for you guys. And if you have any issues with anything, just go to the home port. There's a bunch of MSIBs, NOAs, anything you want to know. Um, we're going to be trying to update as much as possible. For the EPA side of the house, um, I will continue sending you guys to the EPA webpage. We, until the MO, MO, MOU comes into place, um, there's nothing we can do. Uh, we will continue enforcing the MIO, IMO side of the house, but I don't think legally without an MOU saying, hey, this is what you're gonna be um, enforced, we won't be doing anything about it. But we, I know somebody mentioned about the um, IMO regulations, but EIAPP, -E you can have it on board and it still say that you're not in compliance. It can be a check mark that says, this engine doesn't meet the tier three requirement and that will be a flag class issue. They will issue that document saying this vessel was built before this date. Now with the 2021-2023 deadline, this policy letter in here, 
Um, it does indeed says that it will continue covering until the life of the engine. Now, this is a Coast Guard, and this is our guidance. EPA, again, I have no idea what they're gonna say. But once we start learning from what they're enforcing, um, we'll go from there. Now, with an engine that was purchased before 2021, it, all, it can say EPA compliance, or it can say tier two compliance, and we will accept that in that two year deadline. And that's in our policy letter as well. Like that's the guidance that we have as Coast Guard, how are we gonna proceed with this? And then another important policy letter that the Coast Guard uses for enforcement on um, yachts is policy letter 1504 um, that outlines the inspection scheme, um, what certificates are required for yachts. Um, so for the majority of the yachts in South Florida, um, even if the yacht is below 500 gross tons, due to our uh, statutory laws in the United States, some of those recreational yachts under 500 gross tons are still gonna be regulated. So um, a vessel or a yacht could uh, voluntarily comply with SOLAS and get the SOLAS safety um, certificate, or they can get the safety equipment certificate, or the uh, yacht code of um, certificate of compliance with their respective flag state. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but I'm very proud to see that uh, we managed to keep everybody's attention on a subject <laughs> that can be pretty tough. Graham, so, Laura, so and Sagar, thank you very much for your contributions. You guys know this audience, and the audience knows you. Victoria and Fernando, thank you for your service, and thank you for your bravery facing a room full of people that you don't know what they're going to ask. Uh -huh. Thanks for having me.